Having It All is sponsored by Health IQ, an insurance company that helps health conscious people like yoga lovers, runners, and vegetarians get lower rates on their life insurance. Go to healthiq.com slash ALL to support the show and see if you qualify. Welcome to the Having It All podcast, the show about what it takes to live an abundant, loving life. My name is Matthew Bivens, and each week I'm helping you get out of your head so that you can truly have it all. Let's do it. What's going on, everybody? Matthew Bivens here, and welcome to the podcast. I'm psyched that you're hanging out with me today, and I think I'm, I'm extra pumped up on this one because we're talking about race. Specifically, I'm going to be diving into my experience of being biracial, and you might be asking yourself, what the heck does that have to do with having it all and living an abundant, loving life? Well, I think that race can play a very large part in how we self-identify. You know, I think, at least for me, it's impacted the stories that I, that I say about myself and other people. It's impacted my self-worth conversation. And all of those things have influenced how I experience life. And at times, not experiencing life as abundant or as very loving. And at times, not feeling abundant or loving myself, particularly towards people of my own race or different races. And so, I wanted to dive into this because I know there's some people out there who can connect, you know, and and whether or not you have had some challenges with race in your life, you've definitely had challenges or observations, at least, of the, the stories that you've said about yourself limiting beliefs, things that other people have have handed you that you've worn on as your own and therefore have experienced the impact of. So I'm going to get into a lot of stuff today. Um, There's going to be some salty language, I imagine, so you you don't want to listen to this one with young ears because I'm just going to let myself flow. And for me, race has been a very, very emotional topic. It really has. And it hasn't been until the past few years that uh, I've really begun, begun to be more comfortable with myself. And so anyway, I'm going to get into all of that. But first, I want to share some gratitude. Yeah, gratitude to you right now listening, whether this is your first time listening or, you know, you're, you're a returning listener. I appreciate you. I really do. I really, really do. I mean, this show, you, you, you guys fuel me up seeing that people tune in regularly and people come back and then you know when you email me and you you say that you've binge listened to the show I mean that blows my mind <laughs> you know my wife and I we binge watch the office reruns on Netflix but then to hear that that you listen to multiple episodes at once that's amazing so I'm very grateful that you take the time to listen um, I'm extraordinarily grateful when you take the time to reach out and connect with me and there's been a couple of people who recently connected that you know, your messages have touched me. And so I just want to say thank you to Kieran and to Des for your recent emails. Your words, they really, really mean a lot. And if you have feedback you want to share uh, about the show, if you have ideas, if you simply want to connect with me and kind of tell me what's going on with you, um, I'd love to receive it. I dig all of it. And you can do that directly. Email me at mattcbivens at gmail.com. And then I'm also right now conducting a survey. You know, I want to learn a little bit more about you. I want to learn what you like and don't like. I want to hear, like I said before, feedback on the show. You know, if the audio quality is not that great or if you prefer I use a different podcast player, tell me all that stuff. I want to know it. And uh, you can do that at the survey and that's at havingitallpodcast.com slash survey. And everything that you share with me, you know, it really does go to improve the overall show experience. I'm super, super hands-on, and uh, I take everything into consideration, and you know, I just want to create something awesome. So it takes three minutes to fill out the survey. It's super quick. And again, that's at havingitallpodcast.com slash survey. And you know, before we get into the topic today, I just felt, I don't know, I had a message that was just pulling at me. And it has to do, I think, with, with the topic of the episode. But you know, it's just this idea that we get to define who we are in life. And I know personally, I didn't always feel that way. 
But it's true. We get to define it. Us. Only us. Nobody else. You know, not our parents or our family or our spouse, our partner, our friends. Nobody else gets to define who you are except for you. And now those other people, they may try. A lot of times they're going to try. Parents are going to try to, you know, hand down labels or they, you know, friends or peers might try to put you in a box, might try to put you in a nice, neat little box with a category on it and say, this is who you are. And I think part of that is just human nature. We, we like things to be organized. We like being able to describe things in that categorical manner. But it doesn't have to be you. What people say about you does not have to be how you talk and think and feel about yourself. You know, this is your life. It's your story. It's yours to design. It's yours to tell. You are the one with the power. You really are. And I just felt moved to share that message because I don't know what, how things would have been different for me had I heard that message and believed that message when I was younger. So right now we're going to take a quick sponsor break and then we're going to dive into today's topic. When was the last time you were rewarded for making healthy choices in your life? Health IQ provides life insurance for health conscious individuals like you and I And they believe that we should reap the benefits from healthy living. Just like saving money on your car insurance for being a safe driver, Health IQ saves you money on your life insurance for living a health-conscious lifestyle. They use science and data to secure lower rates on life insurance for health-conscious people like runners, cyclists, vegetarians, and yoga lovers. 56% of Health IQ customers save anywhere between 4 and 33% on their life insurance. And these savings are exclusive to Health IQ. Now, when Sarah and I were recently shopping for our life insurance, we would have loved to have saved some money thanks to our lifestyle. Well, now you can. To see if you qualify, get your free quote today at healthiq.com slash all, or mention the promo code all when you talk to your Health IQ agent. race. It's funny. There was a part of me that thought, "Mm, you get into race, this could be pretty, this could be pretty loaded, pretty heavy. And of course I realized that's when I needed to do it. Absolutely. And I could dedicate multiple episodes to talking about race. And and there's people who've done research and written essays and who have very strong opinions on it and all that great stuff. And Um, It's out there, and I'll probably check some of it out myself. Today, I'm really not trying to, I don't know, I'm not trying to guide you in any specific direction. I'm not trying to give you any processes. What I want to do is tell my story, tell my experience with race, and share how it's impacted so many different areas of my life, some for, you know, in great ways and others in not so great ways. And I'm going to be connecting it with this idea of, of how we view ourselves, you know, and, and the things that we make true about ourselves and how that impacts our ability to create and experience an abundant, loving life. And so where I want to start is right now I live in Atlanta, but I was born in Southern California. I was born in this town just above San Diego called Del Mar. And Del Mar is known for a horse racing track and a really great annual fair and just very beautiful beaches. And so I grew up as a beach kid. My family would you know, hit the beach multiple times a week and my friends and I would boogie board and do all sorts of stuff. And uh, I went to a private school out there, a private elementary school. And I lived in Del Mar until I was nine. And I remember my time in Del Mar, you know, I mean, granted, I probably only remember four or five of those years because I was so young, but I just remember it as just like fun, you know, a lot of time spent outside, a lot of time playing with my friends. I had a diverse group of friends and I just remember it being very carefree and um, feel very blessed. I feel very blessed to have that sort of experience. And I, I, looking back now, I wasn't aware of race. I, that wasn't in my, that wasn't in my, 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 my vision, my, 
I don't know. I wasn't thinking about it, any of that stuff. Um, I had friends of all different races. I had Indian friends, Chinese friends, Mexican friends. I had biracial friends, white, black. And yeah, so I just wasn't really thinking about people being in those different boxes. Fast forward to me being nine and I moved out to the suburbs of Atlanta. And that was the first time when I was asked the question, what are you? I remember being nine years old at a brand new elementary school. And I think I'd been there for a few weeks and we moved over spring break. So there was only a couple months left in the school year. So I felt super awkward. And I remember some of those kids, it was a much less diverse school. It was basically white and black at this school that I went to. And I remember kids asking me, what are you? And I didn't know how to answer that question. I didn't really know what they meant. But I soon came to realize they were talking about my, my race, my background. And I would say my mom's black, my dad's white. Because I, I didn't have a word for it. I, I didn't know biracial or, or mulatto. And I don't, I have never really enjoyed that word. But I didn't know how to describe myself. So I'd say my mom's white, my dad's black. And then it would be like, oh, okay. And that was, it was very interesting what being asked that question did for me. Because the way people would ask that question, it was as if I did something wrong. It was as if there was some sort of obvious, I don't know, deformity, right? Like something that they could see that I couldn't, that was obviously wrong with me, that they were curious about. And from that moment, I remember, you know, being around that age, nine, 10 years old, starting to pack on the baggage and starting to build this story that there was something different with me. Therefore, there is something wrong with me. And I started to become aware of race. And it's an interesting time because for a long time, I just felt like that was the South. It was the South moving from California to Georgia that, you know, it it was Southern people had an issue with race, whereas West Coast people didn't. But now as I, as I get older, I'm realizing that that was my level of consciousness and awareness. My experience was the kids I grew up with just were not aware the same way I wasn't. And as I got older, kids became more and more aware and therefore they started asking those questions. So I, you know, I continue going through elementary school and middle school, and again, I'm becoming more and more aware of people's questions, people's glances, and I'm also becoming more aware of the segregation that happens with friend groups in school. You know, like in my middle school, there was the black crowd, there was the white crowd, there was the Latin crowd, there was the Asian crowd, like it, it totally separated into those classic cliques that we're all used to from TVs and movies. And here I was feeling in between, feeling like I was too light for the black crowd, I was too dark for the white crowd, and I didn't fit in anywhere else. And I started to also notice people's looks and questions when I was out with my mom. And I think this is where I started to form this idea that the white part of me was the area to be ashamed of. Because I remember going out with my mom and I'd be with my sisters. I have, I have two sisters and all of us are varying shades of brown. I think I, I kind of am somewhere in the middle. But my sisters and I, we all can get tan very easily. So in the summertime, we would be super dark. In the wintertime, we would be a little bit lighter. But we, my mom, she has an Irish background. My mom is like fair-skinned, freckles, and she used to to color her hair kind of like this reddish, I don't know, burgundy type color. So here's my redheaded mom with freckles with three brown kids. And I remember being in a grocery store and, man, this is such an interesting memory. I'm at the grocery store. My mom is checking out. She's putting things on the belt. And I run up to her and I say, hey, mom, can I get this? And when I said, hey, mom, the woman at the counter who was ringing things up, like, stopped. She stopped and she stared and she gave this incredibly puzzled look, like, you're the mom to those kids? And I just saw what I am, am, am I, you know, 
probably preteen, maybe 12 or 13 year old mind, I perceived judgment. There was judgment. And once again, it reinforced that story that something was wrong with me. Something was wrong with my makeup, was wrong with how I looked. Because here was this stranger throwing some shade at myself and my mom being out in the store together. And it created that feeling. It just, it, it strengthened that feeling of separation. And I started to resent my color. I started to resent my mom. I started to become embarrassed, embarrassed by being around my mother. Because when I was around my mother, she was confirming that I wasn't dark enough. You know, it was, it was her blood, it was her genes that made me a, a, a less, whatever I wanted to fill in the blank at the time, version of myself. And man, there's this part of me right now that's like, boy, I wonder what my mom will say when she listens to this because I haven't shared that with her. And it's, it's not a, I'm not proud of the fact that I held that resentment. I don't like that at all because I just remember feeling like embarrassed. And that's just a fascinating thing to feel embarrassed about. You know, and so I'm going to keep circling back to this idea, but let's just all work on creating a little bit more awareness of the stories that other people have given us. Other people handed that story to me that there was something wrong with me because of my skin color. And I wore it on like it was my own. And it created embarrassment within me. It created judgment within me. It created anxiety within me. So I know I'm going off on a, on a message tangent right now, but I just want to, I just want to say to you listening, what stories have you been replaying that are creating embarrassment, judgment, criticism about yourself or other people? Stories that were handed down by others to you, that because you were young, maybe you were impressionable, whatever it was, you just adopted them and you've just fed them for years. Let's all start being more aware of those. So back on track, you know, here I am as now a, a preteen, teenage kid, and, you know, I'm getting older and, and I'm, I'm starting to be more, I'm starting to be more self-conscious of my image, of how my peers are viewing me. You know, I, I really got hung up on how other people felt about me and what other people thought about me. That was a big thing. And I think I still, I still carry that to this day. You know, that was a big thing that I experienced through middle school and high school. And what happened was I started to behave like other people. I started to do things in order to be accepted. I think a lot of us can, can relate to that. But when I was 13, 14, 15, 16, I so wanted to be accepted by the black crowd. I wanted that more than, more than anything, probably. Just to be viewed as one of one of the guys, you know, because I had my black friends in school. I had my black friends, but I never felt like I was truly accepted by those groups. You know, I, I had, I was friends with one or two and therefore the other five, six, seven, ten would allow me to hang out. And that's kind of how I felt. And I just put myself in this periphery position I remember when I was in middle school and I started to get notes from a girl and it was a secret admirer type thing. She'd leave notes in my locker. I had no idea who it was and it was a week or two went by before I finally, she finally revealed herself and holy shit, she was one of the popular black girls. Oh, damn. You know, I remember thinking to myself, oh, what? And at the time I had created a, a little relationship fling with one of my white friends. Man, this is another story. I haven't told this to anybody. There was a, a, a girl, and I liked her. I had a crush on her. And we had talked about dating. You know, this is like 12, 13-year-old dating, whatever that is. And then this secret admirer, popular black girl comes along, and she is, is, is feeling me, and she wants to date. And I remember, and this is what I did. I broke up with my white girlfriend so that I could date the black girl so that I could gain some status in the black crowd. And that's, that's where I was. 
that it meant so much to me that I would do that. And I don't really think that I ended up talking to my uh, th- that girl after breaking up with her so that I could, you know, become popular. But that's what that's the price I was willing to pay at the time because I had told myself that being accepted meant more than than anything. And so I remember having a handful of black friends and I would emulate them. I wanted to dress like them. I wanted to listen to the music that they listened to. I wanted to wear the sneakers that they li- that they wore. A buddy of mine got this fresh pair of Adidas shoes and I really liked them and I felt like man if I had a pair of those Adidas shoes I would be cool like he is. And so I begged my mom. I begged my mom. And I just I just wore her out and she finally bought me a pair of those shoes. And I remember going to school the next day so proud, right? I got my my fresh pair of Adidas shoes on. I'm wearing some some, you know, Sean John jeans probably and Tommy Hilfiger shirt. And I remember like strutting by him and expecting him to be like, yo, man, look at those flash shoes. And he was like, man, you got those shoes because I got them, Don't, didn't you? And I remember being like, oh, I've been exposed. You know, I've been exposed as, as, a, as a fraud. I'm just trying to be like you. And, you know, he was accurate and he saw it. But, you know, that sort of followed me throughout the rest of my life. When I, I'm trying to be like other people, it doesn't work out for me. <laughs> That's something that I could, you know, I, I've, I've done it on this podcast. The episodes where I've listened to some other, you know, person that I, that, I am, that, I, that I admire and I try to make an episode like theirs, it doesn't work for me. So I guess that's something that I just got to continue working on and repping myself. So, you know, middle school and high school and here I am emulating others and, and just wanting to be darker, wanting to be accepted, you know, not feeling accepted by either group, the white kids or the black kids. And what was interesting for me is I felt like I literally had a foot in each camp. You know, there was aspects of white culture, which I totally identified with. You know, I, I, one of my favorite bands was Green Day growing up in Southern California. That's when Green Day was big and their album Dookie. I love Green Day. I love listening to No Doubt. I was a big fan of 311. You know, I, I, I enjoyed that type of music. I liked rock music. But then at the same time, I also started to, to grow more into the hip hop at the time. So I was big into Jay-Z and I was big into Nas and I was big into, you know, Puff Daddy and Mace and all of them. And like that's, I had a foot in each camp and my clothing choices were the same way. Sometimes I would dress in, you know, Quicksilver shirts. Other times I'd be rocking the San John and I just, I never really gave myself an opportunity to find myself. Because I was so caught up in doing things for the approval of other people. So I never really gave myself a chance to just to think about and discover what is Matthew like? And be comfortable with that. And not label the things that I liked or the people that I admired or the media that I enjoyed as black or white. Because I would label it that way. Even the food I would eat. I would say, oh, this is a white meal. Oh, this is a black meal. Oh, I better enjoy eating Popeye's chicken because that's what my black friends like eating. Oh, you know, I shouldn't enjoy taco night at my house because that's probably what white people eat. Like that sort of conversation was going on in my head. Again, handed down from other people. I just wore it on as my own. I just wore it. And the story that I just kept reinforcing again and again, from that nine-year-old all the way into my 20s, was that I'm not black enough. And if you remove the black part of that, the real message was, I'm not enough. I'm not enough. And so everything that I was doing from those early ages on, everything I was doing was trying to fill that gap that I had created within me that was saying, I am not enough. And so I was always reaching externally. I was always seeking to, to, to add something to my wardrobe, to add something to my list of, of skills, to add whatever, so that people would accept me so that I would feel like I was enough. And it never worked. It never worked. But I remember through college, 
I just had this, I started to develop this resentment towards black men. You know, and it was like, you never accepted me. Therefore, I went the opposite route. Instead of trying to appeal to them, I went the, I, you know, I just wanted to be better than them and everything. And this really started to come out in college. I had a handful of black friends in college, but most of my friends were different races. I had Middle Eastern friends, I had Asian friends, I had, you know, Latin friends. And I remember having this attitude of, I'm going to be better than you in academics. So if one of my, my black friends or black peers or just one of the black kids living on the hall and, uh, you know, where, uh, uh, in my dorm room, if they were doing well in a class, then I felt like I needed to do better. You know, if they were taking certain course, I needed to take the higher one up. And then when it came to sports, that's really where my, my competitive drive kicked in because I started to, to enjoy basketball. I was a soccer player from a little kid all the way through high school. And then when I got to college, I hit a growth spurt. You know, I never liked basketball because I was small, right? But then when I grew a little bit, oh, okay, basketball was much more fun for me. And so now I had an opportunity to dominate the black kids in the sport that's the black sport. And I created this complex in my mind that when I beat you on the court, that's me saying, here I am. Am I black enough for you now? And so that's the competitive nature I created in my mind. And so I would go hard, you know, I would, I would just try to, to dominate. And it was exclusively black men because it was, that's where I had the complex because I felt like black men did not accept me. They did not embrace me as one of their own. That's what I wanted. So it was black men that I ended up turning against in my, my early 20s, mid-20s maybe. And all of that was so fascinating to me. You know, and it's, it, when I look back, it's just the way that things ebbed and flowed, the way that this story thread evolved in my mind is just fascinating. You know, and it, it constantly reminds me that my peace and my joy and my enoughness is internal. And as soon as I'm seeking external means to fill myself up or to validate myself, I'm losing. I'm losing my power because I'm placing the power in the other people's hands. When I stepped on that basketball court and I said, I'm going to beat your ass if that person beat me, then, you know, because I placed the power in their hands, if they scored a point on me or if they won the game, then it would diminish my blackness a little bit and the chip on my shoulder would grow. And that complex, whew, that complex was something else. And you know, it's funny, I just saw the movie Black Panther. I saw the movie Black Panther a few days ago. I'm a huge Marvel fan. You know, I love Marvel movies. I love the, the comic book culture, Star Wars, all that stuff. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a big fan of all of that. So I was, like, I was pumped up to see Black Panther. And I remember watching the movie in the theater. And there's a lot of, like, pri like African pride bleeds throughout that movie. It's celebrated. African culture is celebrated throughout that movie. It's a beautiful thing. And I loved it. And there was this part of me that was feeling that pride. It was feeling that pride. Today, I have a very re different relationship to pride than I did in the past. I, I, I don't seek pride. I don't celebrate pride these days. I am more interested in being inspired. That something is resonating at such a high frequency, at such high calibrating conscious material that I feel inspired, it moves me into some sort of action. It moves me into being a greater person. Pride to me doesn't do that. You know, pride to me can be very exclusive. You know, you can be very prideful about your race, for example, and feel like yours is better than somebody else's. So as I start to identify with this, well, as I started to feel this pride for this movie, it, it brought me back to some of those old feelings, you know, these old feelings of, of wanting to express that pride 
to other black people so that they would validate me being a part of that club and therefore make me feel better because, ah, I feel accepted. Very, very just interesting path that these things take. And so as I look back on years of my relationship towards race, years of, of my just wrestling with, with my own identity, something that, the thing that screams out to me is that race matters as much as you want to believe it matters. And for years, race mattered to me. And the actions that I took, the thoughts that I had, the beliefs that I wore on, because I told myself that race matters, each one of them did not make me a greater version of myself. It did not make me a more loving person. It did not make me a more abundant person. It made me a more critical person. It made me a more confrontational person. It made me a more scarce person. So then my question to you is what are you making race mean for yourself? What are those stories that you're saying about your own race or the race of somebody else and what all of that means? You know, I'm not ignorant to the fact that there is race, right? I'm not ignorant to that at all. Where I want to, at least for myself, and this is going to resonate with some folks, it may not with others, I view race as simply the, 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 the different patches that make up this amazing quilt of life, of the human experience. You know, we're all the same matter. <laughs> we just have slightly different looks to us. There's just variety. Race is variety. And it gets so tricky to me, being somebody of two different races, it gets so tricky to me when there are conversations about one race being more superior than another. And I think that's obvious. You know, you get that. But like, here we are, I've got, I married a white woman. Sarah's white. And she has had her own absolutely fascinating experience with race. She carries a lot of white guilt. She absolutely does. And we were talking about this, I think, before or after seeing Black Panther. There is a part of her that feels badly about mixing her blood with my blood because some part of her feels like she's diluting my blackness. She's diluting the the pool of, of universal blackness for all humanity by mixing her blood in. And therefore, our daughter, who is now one quarter black, like there, it means something now. Can you, like, can you wrap your head around that? I mean, I have had some absurd beliefs about race and ideas about race, you know? And here I am, a biracial person. You might say, well, you, maybe you have, have a reason to. I was not familiar with white guilt until speaking to Sarah. And I'm like, wow, that's fascinating. That, that blows my mind. And so, you know, I'm a man who's raising a, a child, a mixed-race child who 90% of the world is going to view her as white. What am I going to make that mean? What am I going to pass down to her? Maybe consciously, maybe there's things that I'm, I'm telling her about herself that I'm aware of, or maybe it's just subconscious that I'm not aware of. Maybe there's those things that are still within me that I haven't healed, and I'm going to be passing them down to her. That's why for me, it's so important for me to take a really deep look at myself and my relationship towards my race and race in general, at those areas of myself that I have not yet healed, that I have not yet explored, that I've been too afraid to explore, that I've been too afraid to talk about, that I've been too afraid to share with others. It is so important for me as a father of a mixed race little girl who's going to grow up with the stories and the beliefs and the identity that I'm going to help hand down to her. It is so important that I'm doing this work on myself because right now she's a blank canvas. 
And what happened to me is the same thing that happened to you, the same thing that happens to all of us, and the same thing that a lot of us are doing to others. We're handing down our fears to the next generation, handing down our judgments, handing down our identity issues, handing down our self-worth issues, because we haven't addressed them and healed them within ourselves. And so I hope, and I do believe there's a lot of folks out here who are connecting with me right now as I share this message, but I'll be honest, a lot of this is for me. A lot of this right now is me working on exploring those areas of myself that I have not yet healed around my race and around my own identity. Because Maya is, she's perfect right now. And, you know, I, I'm, I understand that there's going to be things that I hand down to her that I don't mean to. And I don't expect myself to heal every single aspect, every limiting belief, every, you know, every little ounce of, of self-criticism or doubts. I don't expect myself to, to get over all of that and to change all of that. I think that's unrealistic. However, if there are areas where it's glaringly obvious that I am still holding on to some sort of attachment, still playing in fear. That's what I want to be able to be aware of and address. Because a lot of my experience when I was growing up, it was not a fun one around race, specifically around race. I, you know, I, had, a, I had a great upbringing. But that conversation, that topic to me was a sensitive one. And it still is, man. You know, there's, there's times, like, let's say I'll be at... If I'm in a group of people and I'm the only, I'll just, you know, for the, for the purpose of this story, I'm going to call myself black. If I'm in a group of people and I'm the only black person, there's a part of me that's expecting and anticipating someone to say nigger. I'm just waiting. Like I'm sitting there on the edge, just waiting for someone to start spouting some racist shit. And I think to myself, what am I going to do when that happens? It's happened a handful of times. It's happened a handful of times. I remember being at a, a, a football party in college. And I'm sitting on the couch. I can't see the people behind me. It's a mostly white crowd. I don't remember if there's any other black people there. And I remember someone dropping a nigger behind me. And like immediately going into panic mode. Do I need to stand up? Do I need to fight? Do I need to you know, defend my race? Do I need to call this out? Like not knowing what to do. So there's a part of me that is incredibly sensitive over that, still is. And it's that type of thing that I want to understand more for myself. I'm still trying to figure that out. I'd be very interested in talking to, to folks who have had a similar experience, biracial or not. So if that's you, hit me up, mattcbivens at gmail.com, because I'm very, very interested in exploring that seeing how other people have handled that scenario, how other people have worked on healing that or shifting that for themselves because that's something that I don't necessarily know what to do with, but I know it's there. And so I bring this all back to the message that I shared at the top of the episode that you know, you get to define who you are in life, not anybody else. Nobody gets to tell you who you are, they're going to try, but it's up to you to wear that on. And if you're listening to this show right now, then you are in a space where you have developed a certain sense of awareness around your own power. And what we're all working on collectively is this maturity, this ability to respond powerfully. And so we get a chance to rewrite those stories that still might be replaying within ourselves. Because you're the author of it. Nobody else. And so, you know, I just invite you to explore what your story is around race and how it has impacted your life experience. Has it moved you closer to towards your greatest self or pulled you further away, kept you from really stepping into your fullness and your power, into stepping into that abundant, loving person that you know yourself to be. And I'm curious how your story around race has impacted how you've viewed other people and how you've seen the world in itself, how you've treated other people. I'm curious about all that stuff. So again, if you want to share, I would love, love, love 
to hear your story, hear your experience, and you know, just connect with you on that and connect with anybody on this topic. You know, it's it's one of those things that I think in this time in, in our country, in the world, it's a thing that we're we're thinking about, people are talking about it. But I, I really want to just for my own self have the most authentic and vulnerable conversations I can around it because I'm very, very committed to healing those areas of myself that I still feel like are ankle weights. And some of that conversation that comes up for me feels like an ankle weight. So if you've got thoughts on any of that stuff, hit me up, mattcbivens at gmail.com. You can also go to my website, havingitallpodcast.com, and there's a contact form that you can fill out. And I would absolutely love to just hear your feedback, hear your perspective. Hmm. Oof. This was an interesting episode. I know I didn't, I have my notes and, and I have my outline and all that stuff, but I was curious what was going to come up. And, you know, it's, it's great because bring like the stuff that comes up, the emotion that comes up, if anybody felt uncomfortable or just felt different things, like that's where you go in. That's your body telling you, hey, there's something here. Let's dive in. Let's go explore it. And we get to the abundant loving life by being bold enough, having the courage, having the cojones and the ovaries to dive into that stuff, to explore it, as opposed to leaving it alone and backing away because it makes us feel uncomfortable because, ooh, I don't want to touch that. Nah, we go in. And if you're a listener of this show, I know that you're open to going in. It might be scary, but you're listening to this show. <laughs> so you you know that this show is about going in. It's about going deep on yourself. It's about exploring your fears. It's about shifting all of that, transmuting that energy and pointing it towards love, pointing it towards acceptance of yourself first, loving yourself, approving yourself, accepting yourself. And then being able to pour that into other people. So let's all just make that commitment to do it around race, around self-identity, around how we perceive ourselves. Because that impacts so much of our lives. It truly does. So yeah, connect with me. I'm complete. My name is Matthew Bivens. And here's to you having it all. Quick note about the Having It All podcast. I am not a doctor nor a licensed therapist. I'm a guy with a story and a passion for conscious conversation. My thoughts, opinions, and beliefs are my own. So please consult with your doctor or healthcare provider regarding any questions or issues you have related to your personal, physical, or mental health.